man, it's great to be uh, back with you. I, I've spoken here once before. It was an awesome time in God's Word with you. And before we get started, I want to make sure that I say a couple of things because he's not here so I can talk about however I want to about Pastor Matt. Um, you guys are blessed with an incredible lead pastor. You are blessed with an incredible lead pastor, okay? Every time I talk with him and his wife about this church, there is such a high level of passion and commitment and excitement about what God is doing in this church. And so you guys are incredibly blessed to have the leadership and the team that you have around you. And uh, the last time I spoke here, I got to see something really cool. I got to see baptisms. I got to see how Grow Life does baptisms. And I got to hear some incredible stories of life change. And um, I I was struck by how powerful they were. And so I just want to encourage you today, uh, based on what I saw the last time I was here, you have a powerful church. You have an incredible life-giving church where God is using your leadership. God is using you to change the world around you because stories like what I heard don't just happen by accident. They happen through prayer. They happen through investment. They happen through commitment. And so I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart to you. Thank you for being an incredible church. Thank you for being a life-giving church to this community because it's looking different because you're here. So what I need you to do, I need you to put your hand up in the air. I need you to stick it out straight in front of you, palm up, bend at the elbow, give yourself a pat at the back because you guys are fantastic and incredible. I'm really excited again uh, to be here and I want to share something. Um, I'm going to start like right here, open, just complete honesty. A couple of years ago, my wife and I had the biggest fight we've ever had in our marriage. Counselors were called, uh, plates were thrown, you know, things like that. I'm I'm kidding, but not really. It was intense and it was all based on this picture right here I want to show you. Does anybody remember this? (laughs) This caused such contention in my household, okay? Now listen, How many of you see black and blue? Awesome. How many of you see white and gold? You are crazy. You are the crazy people. I still love you. My wife saw white and gold. We talked about this at length for hours trying to figure out why she saw something different than what I saw. It was a heated, heated argument. Counseling definitely was needed. But um, the most important thing that you need to know this morning as, as we go through the message is that I was right. It's black and blue, okay? That's just so we're clear. She's not here. She'll never know about it. I was right. It's black and blue. But now there's a new one. I don't know if you've seen this. Show the next picture. Check this out. The shoe. We've had the dress. Now we've got the shoe. Some people, some people see white and pink. No! No, 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 you don't. That right there, that is teal and gray, my friends. Teal and gray. Oh, man. I love starting messages like this. This is fantastic because we disagree right from the beginning. Love it. Awesome way to start. But anyways, listen, here's what I think is interesting about these two optical illusion type things. That dress is only one color. That shoe is only one color, okay, or one set of colors. There's one truth to both of those pictures, but there are two wildly different perspectives, Okay, one truth, two perspectives. So I want to tell you a story in the Bible. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Matt shared with me that you guys talked about Mary and Martha. That's incredible because this week we're talking about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So we're going to talk a little bit more. I'm glad you got a great foundation of who these women are. We're going to talk about their brother. We're going to talk about how Jesus was involved. It's a very interesting story because, again, just like this dress, just like this shoe, there's one truth in this story, but two very different perspectives. Lazarus gets sick. Mary and Martha, who love their brother, they send a message to Jesus, okay? They said, go tell Jesus that Lazarus is sick. He needs to come back and pray for him or heal him or do something because Lazarus is gonna die. Well, this messenger leaves, okay? Lazarus dies. This message gets to Jesus and Jesus says something very, very important. He says, this sickness won't end in death. This sickness won't end in death. It's for the glory of God. And do you know what he does after that? So cool. Jesus does nothing. (laughs) For two whole days, zero, zip, zilch, nada, nothing. He stays exactly where he is, doesn't move an inch to the left or an inch to the right, forward or back. He stays right where he is for two more days. And this is someone that he loved. This is someone he was legitimately sad. The Bible says that he wept over Lazarus. He was, he, was, he was sad that Lazarus was gone. 
He hears this message that, that he's sick. And he says, you know what? This sickness won't end in death. It's going to be for the glory of God. I'm going to do nothing for two days. Interesting, right? It doesn't seem to fit with the nature and character that we know of Jesus Christ. Where's the extended hand? Where's the Zacchaeus? Today I'm eating at your house. Where's the proactivity that we're so used to seeing? He waits for two days, and we're not sure why. Jesus eventually gets back, and Mary and Martha, they come to, her, to him, and, and they're upset because Lazarus is dead. Jesus weeps. He says, move the stone out of the way, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. I always think it's really important whenever we talk about this story that we don't just jump over the fact that a man who was dead is now alive. That is the power of Jesus Christ that you and I serve, that he can make dead things come to life, all right? Whether it's a relationship, whether it's your finances, whether it's a situation, an emotion, something going on inside of you that feels dead and lifeless, we serve a God who has resurrection power. Can I get a good amen this morning? Like, he can make dead things alive. Like, let's not forget that. And he does this in the case of Lazarus. These two women are heartbroken that their brother is dead. Jesus shows up on the scene and makes what's dead alive. There was one truth in this story. Two very different perspectives, okay? The one truth is this. The truth is that this sickness will not end in death. Do you know when Jesus says something, what is that? It is a promise. Turn to your neighbor and say promise. He says, this sickness will not end in death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. See, there's two perspectives. Either Jesus was late or he was what? On time. He was either late or he was on time. He either made a mistake or he did something on purpose. One truth, two perspectives. Just like the shoe, just like the dress. I want us to look at how Mary and Martha both responded to this situation. We don't have to dig very far to, feel, to see how they felt about it. Let's look at verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, Lord, if you had, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Look at verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You ever had those conversations with Jesus? Well, Jesus, if you had just, if you had just done this, or if you had just done that, or if you had just showed me this or showed me that, if you had just, you know what they're saying? Jesus, this is your fault. My pain is your fault. You're late. And if you're like me, you have felt that multiple, at multiple points of your life where you felt like Jesus was late, where you feel like he made a mistake or he missed it, and it's caused you pain, and you're frustrated, and you're angry. Can I have a level of honesty with anybody in here? Anybody ever felt that way? Come on, come on. All right, thank you. We've all been there. They weren't satisfied with how things were around them. And you can look anywhere. You can look at your friendship relationships. You can look at your romantic dating relationships. You can look at your marriage. You can look at your kids, your finances, your neighborhood, your work situation, whatever it is. And you can find yourself in a situation like Mary and Martha where they were just frustrated. Frustrated that Jesus was taking his sweet time instead of showing up and helping me like he should. One truth. Two perspectives. This sickness won't end in death. It's for the what of God? The glory. The glory of God. Because a lot of us would like to say, if you'd given me that job, or if you'd restored my marriage, or if you'd changed my son's heart, if you'd spared their life, if you'd healed their body, if you'd loved me enough or moved faster or told me ahead of time, I wouldn't be in the situation that I'm in now, Jesus. Where have you been? Do you know it's okay to have those honest conversations with Jesus? You know, you're not going to scare him off. He's big enough to handle that. Jesus is big enough to handle your frustration and your disappointment. You're supposed to take everything to him. Do you know that complaining and arguing with God is a form of worship? What? He wants to hear with you. He wants to be intimate with you, an intimate relationship with you. And sometimes that means you being confused and you having to duke it out. Okay? So we have this perspective in life that God missed something and then we're not satisfied. We say, God, if you had done X, Y, or Z, then I'd be better. 
I did this in the first service. We're going to do it again. We're going to hop in a time machine. We're going to go back to the year 2007. Why does 2007 matter, Pastor Jason? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. Because 2007 is when the housing market crashed. And if we were to go back just a year earlier to 2006, you'd find that that was the year that I decided to buy a house. (laughs) Which turned out to be a very frustrating situation to buy a house and then to have the uh, housing market tank. So I found myself in a situation where I couldn't sell the house for even half of what I paid for it. That's what they call being underwater. They call it that because you feel like you're drowning. It's a terrible situation. Not only did it tank then, and I found myself underwater in 2007, but I also discovered something very interesting about the property I had purchased in 2006. It had what Floridians like to call a sinkhole. I can tell by the groans of frustration, you know what I'm talking about. So not only could I not get rid of it or get out of it without having to owe thousands of dollars, now, I don't know if you knew this, but like uh, sinkholes make the value go that way. Not this way. Nobody's looking for sinkhole property. They don't want to get into that because it's, you know, terrifying. So I'm in this terrible situation. And my wife and I, we are confused, lost, frustrated, angry, unsure of what the heck is going on right now. And we have these conversations with God of, what are you doing? (laughs) Where are you? You should have, why, why did you let me buy this house? Why couldn't you have just like told me in a dream? Like, yeah, like you did with Joseph. Joseph, get out of there. Go to Egypt. Why couldn't you have just told me? Don't sign the papers. I would have listened. I'm an obedient dude. He could have, but he didn't. I wonder why. I wonder why. See, I wasn't satisfied with how things were going on around me. And the reason that you and I aren't satisfied with what's happening around us is because we use a flawed unit of measurement. We are measuring satisfaction incorrectly. The very human way, the very natural way that you and I measure satisfaction is this way. I am satisfied when I am comfortable. When I'm happy, when things are going my way, when I can understand everything, when I got a good bead on it, when things are lining up, when I feel in control, oh, I'm happy as a clam. Stoked to be doing life. Yeah. But for you and I, who are believers in Jesus Christ, who are seeking a mature and growing relationship with him, that's not how we measure things anymore. We instead have to adopt and adapt to a new unit of measurement, and it's this. It says, I'm satisfied when God's glorified. Martha and Mary said, come on, Lazarus is sick. Jesus said, this sickness won't end in death. It's for the glory of God. See, Jesus, who was hurting, who, lost, who someone was sick, he would have had compassion for Lazarus and Mary and Martha. They were close. They were tight. They were buddies. He didn't operate by what made him comfortable because he could have just snapped his fingers right where he was and Lazarus would be fine. But instead, he allowed something to happen. It had purpose. He allowed it to happen. Why? Not because it made him comfortable. Not because it made him happy. I mean, let's, can we talk about the cross for a second? You think Jesus was happy and comfortable on the cross? Absolutely not. But he chose to let go of his comfort so that what? God could be glorified. Jesus is our example in all things. It's our job as believers and followers to follow his example. And he gives us this example of it's not comfort. No, 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 it's not ease. It's not you being happy. No, 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 it's God the Father being glorified with how I think, how I speak, how I act, the choices that I make, the places that I go. God's glory, not my comfort. So we have to adopt this new normal. We have to make a new normal, a new way of thinking that I'm going to be satisfied when God's glorified, not just when I'm happy. You with me this morning? I know it's super encouraging. Yeah, get comfortable with pain. Yeah, Uh uh-huh. Because when you see what that pain will produce when it's in the hands of God, you would never, ever want to make a different choice. Ever. Hmm. The thing that matters most is that people see who he is when they look at what's going on with me. Do people know who he is based on what's going on around you? Not that everything will be perfect, 
But the way that you respond to the terrible things that happen speak volumes to the hundreds of thousands of people that are watching your life. How you respond to what goes wrong matters more now than it ever has before. You want to know why? Social media. When something goes wrong and you post about it and man, woe is me and it's terrible and I, this is just not fair. Yeah. Or I wonder what God's going to do with it. I wonder how he's going to use it. I wonder how this will reveal his glory to the people around. How you interact with the situations around you will speak volumes to the people who are watching your life. And it's really important to note that God didn't cause Lazarus to die. God does not need to cause bad things to set himself up to be the good guy, right? He doesn't need to do that. We live in a broken, fallen, sinful world. That's why things decay and that's why things die. Jesus will use what happens for the glory of the Father. He doesn't have to cause a problem to set himself up as the solution. But he will use what we go through to bring glory to the Father. So we have to learn to think this way, a new way, that we're satisfied when God's glorified. And there's three things that we have to do that. We have to learn to trust three things. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write it down. Here they are. God's promises, God's timing, and God's purpose. There are three things that we have to learn to trust. His promises, his timing, and his purpose. So let's talk about God's promises real quick. Why did Martha and Mary react the way that they did when they saw Jesus? They both said the same thing to him. If you had been here, as if to say, you're late, buddy. They both said the same thing. Why did they react that way? You have to listen to how this story is set up. Our perspective can be shaped by two things, either our pain or our promises, okay? Everybody got that? Put two fists in the air. Come on, do it with me. Pain, promises. There are two things that you can allow to shape your perspective, Okay, you can put your hands down. You know what's interesting? Is scholars believe that Mary and Martha sent a messenger to Jesus, and as soon as that messenger left to go tell Jesus that Lazarus was sick, Lazarus died. Jesus was about a day's journey away. And when the messenger gets there that day later, he says, this sickness won't end in death. But why is that confusing? (laughs) Because Lazarus already what? Died. The messenger didn't know it. Jesus did. So the messenger returns to Mary and Martha. And what do you think the messenger did when he returned? That was a two-way communication. It's not just, oh, go tell Jesus he's sick. If Jesus said the sickness won't end in death, don't you think the messenger would have told Mary and Martha? He brings this message back right on the heels of Lazarus dying. So on one hand, they have their pain of their brother being dead. It's over. It's final. There's nothing that can happen. It's finished. And on the other hand, this messenger shows up. Hey, guys, I got great news. Jesus just said this sickness won't end in death. What? So on one hand, they have their pain. And on one hand, they have the promise of God that says the sickness won't end in death. Didn't say it wouldn't include death. Oh, Oh, you got to get that. You got to get that. Jesus didn't say he wouldn't die. He said it wouldn't end in death. Situations in your own life might have to die before they resurrect, people. He didn't say it wouldn't include it. It just said it wouldn't end there. The removal of pain is not the purpose of God. The use of pain to glorify God is the purpose of God. So they're holding their pain in one hand and the promise of God in the other. And you and I... We'll do this every day of our lives. We will hold the pain of what's happening around us, and we will have to learn to hold up the promises that God has given us in his word. All throughout scripture, there are so many incredible promises that he's given us. And we will have to choose what shapes our perspective. We'll either choose to believe that it's over and done, and there's death and decay, and it's impossible, or we will have faith. Promises give us faith faith to believe that the impossible is possible. Amen. We will have to choose what we're going to allow to shape our perspective. They used their comfort as a measure of success, which is why they weren't satisfied. That's why they said, Hey, if you had been here. So here's three things that we have to do. If we want God's promises to shape our perspective, there's three things. They're real easy. First of all, seek his promises. 
You can't stand on what you don't know. You have to know what the word of God says, which means you have to daily get into the world, word and be renewed by the word. Be renewed by his promises. Be renewed by what Jesus says. That's why we've all heard that, you know, read your Bible every day. It's so trite, and we pass over it, and we gloss over it, and we think, yeah, it's kind of a thing that I'll do, but maybe not. It is crucial to your survival as a believer and follower to have your mind reprogrammed by the truth and the promises of God's word so that you can walk in faith in the midst of fear. That's why we got to do it. You have to seek them out. You have to know what he's promised us. And then the next thing is you have to suspect his promises are at work. Everybody say say suspect. Suspect. I'm a suspicious person. And it doesn't normally serve me very well. Like when I see like two people talking, let me tell you how my brain works. I bet they're talking about me. I bet there's something they don't like. I bet they have a whole like group chat going about how I'm dressed and what they don't like about it. I bet they're talking about it. I bet their whole small group that they say they're worshiping Jesus is really all about me and what they don't like about me. Maybe that's why I didn't get invited to that thing that they did last week. Anybody else with me? Nobody? You're all perfect. Okay, great. Maybe it's just me. Come on, guys. We all get into that circular logic where we just dig a giant hole for ourselves and it just gets worse and worse and we like extrapolate all these details that don't exist. That don't exist. That's sometimes what I can do. I'm suspicious. And normally my suspicions lead me in a negative situation. But what if we could suspect that the promises that we've learned are actually at work? Oh, they're talking over there. Oh man, I bet they're talking about how they're going to bring new people into their group. That's great. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? I didn't get invited. Well, maybe they really prayed about who they should be and God gave them specific people. See, there's two perspectives, only one truth. You can let your pain or the promises shape it. And we have to suspect that God's promises are work. Because you know what? Sometimes I'll go through, like when I, my sinkhole happened, I was like, God, what are you doing? You're definitely not at work here because this is bad and this is terrible. And who would choose this for someone that you claim to love? God, I thought you loved me. Doesn't that mean that my life is going to be easier because you love me? You sent your son to die for me. Why'd you also send me a sinkhole? What are you doing? These two things don't line up. Or do they? We have to train ourselves to be suspicious that God actually means what he says when he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for each other that you may be healed. That's a promise. Do we believe it? Do we enact it? Suspect that those things are true rather than I'm lost, I'm broken, there's no hope for me. Because when we start to suspect that his promises are at work, things that are hopeless start to look like they have hope to them. Things that are worthless start to feel like they've got some value. Things that are pointless have purpose. Things that seem to be failures can now be turned into successes because we have his promise. And isn't a promise of God sure? Like I've made promises, guys, but to be honest, I've broken quite a few too. God is the only one who has the limitless resources, limitless love, and limitless commitment to back up every stinking word that he says. We have to know them, we have to suspect that they're at work, and we have to surround ourselves with people who also suspect God's promises. If you look at the scripture, you can realize that Mary and Martha said the exact same thing. Mary said, Jesus, if you had been here. Martha said, Jesus, if you had been here. You know why they said the exact same words? Because they'd been talking to each other. Well, if Jesus had just been here. If Jesus had just been here. Don't tell me that the people you're around don't matter and don't influence your life. They influenced each other in a negative way. Well, if Jesus had just shown up, Lazarus would be here. I wouldn't have to cry these tears. I wouldn't have to feel this pain. They were talking to each other. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to people that are going to say, well, yeah, Jesus has abandoned you because those people exist. And if you're sitting next to them, don't nudge them. Okay, don't do that. That's not, we're in church. Have a little bit of grace. But there are also those people that exist that say, hey, I know it looks bad, but I bet God has a plan. Hey, I know you're frustrated and pain, but I bet God is at work to give you something, not to take something. Because our God is a giver, not a taker. That was the the lie that that the serpent got got Eve to believe, that God is a taker rather than a giver. But from the beginning, God has always been a giver. God will always be a giver. God continues to be a giver. What is he giving you in this situation? So that's how you start to trust his promises. Learn them. 
suspect that they're at work and surround yourself by people who also suspect God's promises. Be in community. We got to talk about God's timing. If you are going to start seeing things and start to change your unit of measurement for satisfaction to be that I'm satisfied when God's glorified, you have to start to trust God's timing. I want to show you this verse. It's the end of verse five at the beginning of verse six, but I've bolded some things so that it speaks a certain way to us. Look at this verse. I'm going to read the whole thing first. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now read what's bold. Now Jesus loved, so he stayed two days longer. Because he loved, he chose to stay two days longer. See, if it had said, and he stayed two days longer, well, that would just be more information. But it says, so. I love them, so I will wait. I love them, so I won't move right away. Because if I moved right away, they would miss something. I would be robbing them of something if I moved right now. Jesus loved, so he waited. This is something that I didn't know until very recently, but it's changed how I feel and how I look at God. Do you know that God selects his timing based on his love for you? It's not based on his availability or whether or not he used too much of his Jesus power in one day and he's running low. That's not how he chooses his timing. He chooses it based on what is best for you. That's what's best for him. He selects his timing because of his love. Look at verse three with me for a second. We gotta understand this about timing, that he selects his timing because of his love. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Anybody like get a taste of manipulation in that sentence just a little bit? It didn't just say Lazarus, because they could have just said Lazarus. Lazarus is sick, come back. No, they said The one whom you love, as if to say, Jesus, don't forget, you really love him. Move a little faster. We believe because of your love for him, you're obligated to do something a little quicker. Do you know that when it comes to the timing of God, you can't speed him up? But we try to. We throw a few more dollars in the plate. We throw up a few quick prayers just because we really need him to do something. We try to read a couple, like one more verse a day just because I really need that extra something. God cannot be sped up. Look at this next verse right here. He was with his disciples on the outside of Jerusalem. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? See, on one side, you've got Martha and Mary saying, Hurry up, get here, Jesus, move faster. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And on the other hand, you have the disciples. Do you know that Jesus had just been in Jerusalem and told Jerusalem, I am the son of God. And they tried to stone him. And he left. And this is where he would have to go back to in order to go back to Mary and Martha. The disciples were like, hey, if we go back, there's like a real solid chance we're all going to die. But here's what you can know from this story is you can't speed him up and you can't slow him down, but you can be sure that he's coming. You have to believe this about the timing of God. God's not afraid of man or any of man's situations. There's nothing terrifying enough to keep him away. I want you to look at verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. How many days? Four days. Why does it matter that we know how many days? We don't know yet. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been there for four days. Everybody say four days. Why four days? Why? It's in there twice. With no particular reason except for this one. I did some study, and I thought this was really interesting. Why it would mention four days in, in two places without any like reason. Because the Bible is so on purpose, guys. Every word that's in there is supposed to be in there. Every word that's not in there is not supposed to be in there. Four days, twice, with no apparent meaning. But did you know this? Back then, in that time, in the Jewish belief system, in the Talmud, it would say that the spirit of a person would hover above their body after they died for three days. But after that third day, it would be impossible for that body to come back to life. Jesus 
waited until it was impossible before he came to move. He waited until it was absolutely impossible and improbable and just not going to happen in all of the minds of the onlookers before he stepped into the situation and turned it on its head. This is important because some of you got to know you're, you're in like day two or day three of whatever situation you feel like Jesus is late for and you feel like it's impossible and you feel like it's not coming, but he's waiting for that God would get the glory. Because if it's still within your power to do something, you hold back some of the glory. But when it becomes impossible, there's only one person that can get the praise and the glory, and that is God the Father. He waited till it was impossible. Don't give up. Have faith in the promise of God. When God says this sickness won't end in death, it's not going to end in death. It may include it, but it won't end there. And it may seem impossible. Four days. Everybody in that culture believed that after four days, there's no way. Jesus shows up and says, I'm the way. I'm the way. All you need is me. So for his timing, know that he selects it because of love. He does it for our benefit. Know that you can't speed him up and you can't slow him down. You can't control God. And know that he's going to wait until God will get the most glory before he moves. You with me? We're almost done. The last one is God's purpose. God is always at work to give our difficult situations a purpose. You know that there was more than one miracle in this story. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says this. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come. Where did they come from? Jerusalem. Why does that matter? Well, Jesus had just been in Jerusalem. Yeah, they just tried to kill him. These people that are at the funeral party with Martha and Mary are some of the same people that picked up stones to murder Jesus. Same crowd of people. They came to console them concerning their brother. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, Martha went to her sister, or Mary went to uh, to Martha in private. Why in private? Because they were afraid that these people were going to still try to kill Jesus. I never knew why they had to be in private until you dig a little deeper and you realize who was in the room. The same people who were trying to kill him. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Verse 31, when when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise and go quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. These people who had tried to kill Jesus, who didn't believe that he was the son of God, followed Mary and Martha and ran into Jesus. Why did they follow him? Why did they follow them to the tomb? Why did they follow them and eventually meet Jesus? It was because of Mary and Martha's pain. It was because of their pain that these unbelievers followed them to the tomb and on their way they encountered Jesus. I wonder with my pain and with your pain, if we will be faithful to trust God, if he will use it to bring unbelievers to meet his son, Jesus. That's why there's two miracles in this story. Verse 41 says, they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. See, what we have to know about the purpose of God and how it applies to our pain is we are a window through which people see the greatness of God. We glorify God when we show his attributes through our struggle. Whatever you're going through with your children or your marriage or your job or your finances, it is a window for people to see the faithfulness of God. And it may seem like it's dead, and it may seem like it's impossible, and there may seem like there's no way out, except Jesus is the only way. And he can show up, and he can change everything. Don't be mad about your pain. Don't be frustrated by your pain. Be expectant that God is going to use your pain to bless you and change the lives of others. You are the window, and people have to look through you to see Jesus. They have to look through your pain, through your frustration, through your tears, to see how he will provide and make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen? And he will do it, because if you look at verse 45, listen to what it says. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. 
It was Mary and Martha's pain that drew unbelievers towards Jesus so that they could see his power and believe in him. Our grief, our frustration with our situation can be a tool in God's hand to bring the lost to salvation. Because the design beneath all of our discomfort is to glorify God. That's why we have to change how we measure it, that I am satisfied when God is glorified. I'll just close with this. In 2007, I thought I had made the worst decision of my life. I bought a house. It was underwater, had a sinkhole. We went through five years of litigation trying to figure out how to offload this albatross around my neck. At the end of it, here's what happened. I was able to walk away owing. If any of the strategies that I had tried during that time had happened, I still would have owed thousands of dollars. If any of my plans had worked, I would have been worse off. But instead, none of my plans worked out, worked out. And they came to me and said, you know what? Sign these papers. You're done. Not only that, but we're going to give you money to give us the keys. <laughs> Guys, I thought this was the worst mistake of my life. I thought this was going to mar my financial history. It was going to hurt my marriage, my kids, our financial like, stability for the future for decades. And instead, I got to walk away owing nothing. And instead, they paid so that I would hand them the keys. And that amount of money was exactly the amount of money that I needed to pay my lawyer. And the way that they worded the letter, my lawyer had never seen before. He, he, she looks at it and says, I've never, either they're really stupid or something miraculous has just happened. I've never seen it worded this way. They can't come after you. And she looked and said, I've never seen anything like this before. And I said, it's because it's God's favor. My lawyer looked through the window of my pain and my frustration for five years and saw something she'd never seen before attributed to Jesus. She got to see his goodness through my pain. Ask me if it's worth it. Yeah, worth it. For one soul to enter the kingdom after they observe God's provision through our lack and through our need ask me if it's worth it. It's worth it. Because I believe one day that woman is going to give her heart to Jesus. That's what God can do. But you have to hang in there and you have to trust and you have to lean into his promises, trust his timing and realize that there is a purpose bigger than you and me and have to start measuring things by I'm satisfied when God the Father is glorified. Amen.